Good afternoon, my name is Alex Padilla. I am the director of the Exploring Economic Freedom Project. Today we are very fortunate to be hosting a debate on a major issue, sweatshops in the global economy, exploitation or salvation, with two experts who have different opinions on this crucial issue. Allow me to give you a brief introduction to the Exploring Economic Freedom Project and to thank our sponsors. Right. The Exploring Economic Freedom Project was founded in 2007, and its main objective is to serve as a forum to explore and to debate the best means to achieving the broader goal of helping improve people's well-being, and more particularly, the least well-off. The Exploring Economic Freedom Project organized a lecture series where guest speakers come to lecture or to debate about various issues related to this broader goal, which is to discover the best means to help people live better life. The topics are all related to exploring the costs and benefits of economic and political freedom as they relate to issues such as stimulating entrepreneurship, economic growth, prosperity, promoting peace, reducing poverty, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All the topic we are going to address today, which is sweatshops and extreme poverty. I would like to conclude by thanking our general Sponsors, the Charles G. Cook Charitable Foundation and the Institute for Human Studies. Both organizations share the vision and philosophy I described above. In addition to sponsor lecture series and debate like ours, they also sponsor educational programs, weekend seminars, and summer seminars on campuses across the country during which students get to learn, to discuss, and to debate about issues that we all care about in various degrees from a multidisciplinary viewpoint. Now allow me to introduce you to our moderator for the debate today. We will also introduce the speakers, John Caldera. John Caldera is the president of the Independence Institute, which is the Colorado Free Market Think Tank, which is here in Denver. He also hosts radio talk programs on 630K How and 830K OA. He is also the host of the current affairs television program Devil's Advocate with John Caldera, which airs on Colorado Public Television Channel. Please. Welcome, John Caldera, and I hope you enjoy the debate. Why is it that Alex's accent makes everything sound better? Uh, my role here is to keep this conversation moving and moving quickly, so let you know the uh, program. Each one of our debaters will have 10 minutes to present their side on sweatshops and poverty. Then they'll respond to each other for about seven minutes, at which point we want to take questions from you directly, and we'll moderate that. Uh, I think it's incredible that we have two such in, uh, great speakers on this. John Miller is the professor of economics at Wheaton College in Norton, Massachusetts. He is a contributing editor to Dollars and Cents magazine. He's been doing that since the late 70s. He also serves on the editorial board of the Review of Radical Political Economics. And to my knowledge, John is the only economist who teaches a course that is dedicated to sweatshops, entitled Sweatshops in the World Economy. To start us off, however, will be Benjamin Powell, who is the director of the Free Market Institute at Texas Tech University. He's a visiting uh, professor from uh, Rawls College of Business. As you know, he is a senior fellow at the Independent, not Independence Institute, two different organizations. And he's the author of a book, Out of Poverty, Sweatshops in the Global Economy. You've seen his work in Investors Business Daily, the Financial Times of London, and Christian Science Monitor. Let's start this uh, conversation going. Ben, why don't you come up and start us off? Excellent. Thank you, John and, and Alex, for having me here. I'm thrilled to be back at Metro State and to be debating this, and particularly thrilled to be sharing it with John Miller. I've known John's work for more than a decade, uh, found myself largely in disagreement with it, and perhaps he could probably say about the same with mine. Uh, I expect a friendly conversation, but probably a spirited one as a result, so I think this is going to be a lot of fun for us, and uh, hopefully while we're having fun, you will as well, uh, and maybe learn something in the process. Uh, I do have a rather awkward position to start with, though, giving 10 minutes in order to lay out a controversial and con uh, counterintuitive position for most of you, probably. Uh, that said, I'll do my best to power through it uh, quickly. As a uh, byproduct of that, I won't be able to go into all of the caveats and little exceptions that could apply to the general rules that I'm giving 
or talk about the different empirical results that somebody might find that are contradictory and why I don't think they're very convincing. Uh, I suspect John will be bringing up lots of those things in his time, and then maybe we'll hash it out when we go back and forth with our next seven minutes afterwards. So we have to begin with wage determination. If we want to improve the lives, and I should say a point of agreement for both John and I, he can tell me if I'm wrong, is that this is a means ends analysis. For both of us, the goal is improving the lives of workers in the third world, and for that matter, potential third world workers. Uh, the question is the means to achieve it. And any fruitful conversation about that must start with the economics of wage determination. It's not something that can be wished away. So the basic case for wage determination, there's going to be two limitations on it. The upper bound, the most any employee is able to be paid, is going to be their productivity or marginal revenue product in econ speak. It means how much you contribute to the firm's revenues. If an employee creates $2 a day worth of value to a firm, the absolute maximum that firm is willing to pay them is $2. At $2.01, they lose money every day that worker works there. A profit-maximizing firm never hires them in the first place, or they fire them. Now, of course, firms don't want to pay that much. And from their perspective, they're greedy profit maximizers. They ideally like to pay zero. But they can't do that because they're limited by whatever that worker's next best alternative is. That's your lower bound. So the workers in econ speak opportunity costs in common sense, whatever their next best job option is. So those are your two bounds for wages. Upper bound, productivity, how much you can contribute to firm revenue. Lower bound, whatever your next best alternative is. In practice, these tend to be pretty close together, actually. So I think there are some things we could talk about, about bargaining power and getting you closer to the top of the range, but it's not the lion's share of the action when we're looking at people who are living in extreme poverty. Just getting them higher up in that bargaining range isn't transformative of getting them from pre-industrial standards of living to something that approaches first world standards of living. The real game here is moving that productivity, that upper bound. And what I'd argue is that sweatshops play a role in this process. They play a role in doing things that increase productivity, and they play a role in raising that upper bound too. You don't want a situation where it's just the Nike subcontractor in town and your alternative is scavenging in agriculture. What you want is Reebok and Nike subcontractors located near each other and bidding against each other for the workers. And it's that process of competition that pushes you up towards that upper bound. What I, my, my basic thesis that I'm going to outline in this 10 minutes is that sweatshops pay, uh, are the best available alternatives to the workers now, that the very process that sweatshops are part of when countries engage in improving their institutions are part of the process that transforms people from pre-industrial to post-sweatshop standards of living, and that unfortunately, I think much of the policy, many of the policies that the anti-sweatshop movement has agitated for, many but not all, would actually be counterproductive and slow this process of transformation from, for these workers. So with that in mind, let's take one of the favored policies of anti-sweatshop advocates, a minimum or living wage, legislating a price for labor in the third world. Most don't say that you need to have a first world style minimum wage of whatever the federal minimum is in the United States applied to Bangladesh. Almost everybody understands that would lead to massive unemployment. In fact, it has. The United States, when we passed our first minimum wage law in 1938, it applied to the United States and all of its territories. That minimum wage was set at 25 cents an hour. At the time, average productivity in the United States was about 62 and a half cents an hour. But in Puerto Rico, one of the territories, it was three to four cents an hour. What you got was massive employment and business closure in Puerto Rico when the law passed, they had to amend it. So usually, instead, advocates will say, we don't want a US minimum wage for these countries. We need some sort of living wage tied to whatever the cost of living there is. And we need to legally mandate it. But that doesn't fundamentally address these bounds. It doesn't create new opportunities. And it doesn't make the workers more productive in those jobs. But if we're doing something that changes the cost of labor without moving those bounds, what we're doing is going to force workers out of jobs. If that minimum wage comes in above what your upper bound is, you are going to lose your job. Employers, if they're being profit maximization, which I know of no reason to question that that's what they're after, when they're employing workers, they're going to continue to keep employing more and more workers until it's just barely worth it to hire the last one. That means when you do something to raise the cost of labor, any minimum wage that's big enough to have a positive effect on some worker of raising their wages, maybe falling between the two bounds for that guy, is also simultaneously going to be high enough to throw other workers out of work. That means we're going to take them out of the sweatshop job that they chose to be and admittedly chose from a bad set of alternatives, but that choice, I think, has economic and moral significance. That choice demonstrates that in the worker's mind, that was their best available option. The last thing we should want to do is take away their best available option. What do the other options in these countries look like? What we have to keep in mind is the pervasive poverty in countries where sweatshops operate. This is a list of countries where protesters have identified sweatshops. 
uh, in the period between 1995 and 2010 when I was finishing up the manuscript for the book. And what you see is huge chunks of the population in most of these countries living on less than $2 or $1.25 a day. Once you adjust for purchasing power differences across these different countries, so it's controlling for cost of living differences. I mean, Bangladesh, this is the one that's been in the news most uh, over the past couple of years because of some factory disasters. But you're dealing with 80%, 85% of the population living on less than $2 a day. For the 4 million people who work in the uh, Bangladesh garment industry, this is a step out of that extreme poverty. So what I did is I looked at all of the cases reported in US news sources uh, that reported sweatshops uh, in a pejorative sense and the wages that were paid over that 15 year time span. In these countries, when you add them together, put in the purchasing power, so it's apples to apples, just like we did in the last graph, this is the average sweatshop wage in these countries. Not the average, by the way, garment industry wage, but the average of the places that have been singled out as sweatshops. Every one of them gets you over that $2 a day threshold, something huge chunks of the population in these countries don't do. And some of them, particularly Latin American ones, gets you significantly above that. Should we want better for these workers? Of course. The question, or the, the fear though is, that in doing particular policies of trying to make their lives better, you throw them out of this and back into that. That's much worse. And that's what I think a minimum or living wage does to them. How about working conditions then? I debated this issue with a labor rights activist one time and she actually started by saying, I'm going to admit that the wages in sweatshops are higher than the alternative. The whole problem is working conditions. We just need to mandate higher safety standards. Well, the problem with higher safety standards is they come at a cost. If you raise the cost of employing this labor in the third world, you're going to employ less of it. It doesn't matter whether you leg legislate it for their safety or for their wages. Either way, it's a cost that raises the uh, cost of hiring third world labor, which makes companies hire their substitutes, relatively more productive, more expensive first world labor, or hire fewer third world workers and use more capital with the fewer workers that they employ. In either case though, you're shifting people out of that step up from extreme poverty and back into the even worse poverty. So the other alternative is it could come out of the mix of compensation. So you raise the cost by mandating higher safety, employers say, okay, we'll give you higher safety, but we're going to take away some of your wages. But actually the mix of compensation we see is largely dictated by worker preferences constrained by what their overall pay is going to be. So an employer cares about the total cost of their labor. How that cost is divided between health, safety, other benefits and wages, relatively indifferent adjusting for productivity differences. A cost is a cost is a cost. Who does care? The employee, the employee, you think about your own job that you've had over time, you care about what your mix of compensation looks like. That means employers have every incentive to tailor the mix of compensation to the employee's preferences. Um, and that's exactly what I found. By the way, this is kind of core economic compensating differential price theory, not particularly controversial, but this activist said that's just economic theory. Could you show me some evidence? So I went to two firms in Guatemala that have been singled out as sweatshops for these abuses. Incidentally, the sweat stain under my arm was purely accidental. The car wasn't air conditioned that I rode there in. Um, but I asked these workers the constrained question, uh, would you be willing for, to work for less pay if your employer improved any number of these conditions listed by the National Labor Committee? The universe, no, 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 no. Basically, they weren't willing to give up any pay and that makes sense. Put yourself in their situation. You're desperately poor trying to feed, clothe, shelter your family. You're gonna want the vast majority of your meager compensation to come in the form of wages. How are working conditions gonna improve? As you become more productive, your overall compensation goes up, you'll want better working conditions, uh, and you'll sacrifice some of your increased pay in order to get those. So let me la wrap up then and finish the last slide on the process of economic development here. Sweatshops are not new. I grew up around the factories that used to be sweatshops in the United States in Massachusetts. I went to undergraduate at University of Massachusetts, Lowell, the heart of the Industrial Revolution here. We had sweatshop working conditions in the 19th and early 20th century in the United States. Some of my ancestors worked in them. How did they go away? through the process of economic development. This is what's been curing sweatshops in the United States, in Great Britain, and around the world for the past 200 years, 200 plus years. What do sweatshops bring with them? Capital, technology, at least relative to what your antecedent technology was, and relative to working on the farm opportunities to build some human capital. Those are your three proximate causes of economic development. Your three things that increase your productivity, your upper bound, but when sweatshops come, they're part of that process of bringing the very thing that raises it. Would employers like to pay you more as you get more productive? Of course not. But it's the competitive process between them that forces them to in, uh, improve conditions and improve pay as you're becoming more productive.
through this process. In Great Britain and the United States, that's about a 100 to 150 year process. All the capital and technology had to be created anew. Around, think of uh, sweatshop countries circa 1960. Hong Kong, Singapore, Thailand, uh, Taiwan, South Korea. In a generation, they made the jump. The capital, the technology came in. They had relatively good institutions. They grew through this quickly. Uh, Professor Miller is probably going to tell you that that's correlation, not causation, and we might not need this stage. I, of course, as a matter of science, agree that correlation is not causation. But in this particular case, that's what we need economic theory for. And I've articulated an economic theory that explains how sweatshops play a role in raising productivity, how that, coupled with competition, would improve the wages and working conditions. And then when we work, look at the world, we see exactly that process in action. Thank you. Let's invite John Miller to, to come up. And I believe you have a slideshow as well. Um, Don't yeah, worry, our yeah. technical assistant from France will be here to help All us right, out. Well, it's good. Because France is known for technical assistance. Some, some imported labor. Right. Must be due to bringing down uh, barriers to immigration. Used to call India, now you call France. John Miller. Okay, um, I feel like I should get 20 minutes because I can never speak as fast as Ben just spoke. Um, and is there an echo in the back? Yeah, because whatever that last thing you said that I, I, I do wrong, I couldn't hear it. Um, but oh well. Um, so first let me thank Alex for setting up this debate and I hope it is a productive one and for being such a good host to both Ben and I. And I also want to acknowledge Kishore Kulkarni, who's been um, my friend for since well, about 40 years now, since we were both in graduate school at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and uh, similar to what you said, Ben, I, I've watched your work over the same time period since I started doing work on, on sweatshops and since I had the audacity to write an article called why economists are wrong about sweatshops and the anti-sweatshop movement. And I really respect Ben's work because I think he's one of the most consistent uh, critics of the anti-sweatshop movement. His positions and arguments have always been laid out with great clarity and he does it with great passion and with great speed as I now know. Um, despite that, I think you're right. We fundamentally disagree both in our take on sweatshops and what to do about them. So here's what I want to do, and I've already begged for a minute or two because when I did this, I couldn't do it. I'll gladly give up my other time, and I do think speed of speech should be weighted in here. Um, I want to say something about um, the Rana Plaza disaster in Bangladesh of a couple of years ago. Um, I, and in saying that, I, I think this is a means ends analysis, and I think Ben would think it is just as much a tragedy uh, uh, on an uh, unthinkable scale as, as I do. Um, and then try to lay out the reaction to it and try to establish sort of where our differences are that way. So I think I can, uh, oh, it worked. Yeah, it did work. So th this is Bangladesh. Uh, Rana Plaza um, was a building just north of the capital city in Dhaka. Um, on about two years ago, on April, through on April 24th, um, it collapsed. It was an eight-story building that had been extended from five. Um, it was a retail building that was made into a factory and had the weight of machines on it, which, which led to the collapse. Um, 1,139 people died. This was the worst accident ever in the garment industry. Um, another 1,000 people were permanently injured, or at least uh, injured long-term. Um, whoops. Yeah, I'll skip it. I skipped ahead, but the, I, I was reporting from, from uh, there was a report throughout, the, you know, it was covered extensively throughout the news, newspapers in Asia. And what they said was, you know, what happened was inspectors went in the day before, they saw cracks in the wall. They said, you know, you really shouldn't be using this. Um, the owner kept the building open. There are five factories in it. Um, employing a little over 5,000 workers. 
70% of them came to work that day, Wednesday morning, when the collapse happened at 9 o'clock. Um, 5,000 workers all together, more or less, and um, some of them under the threat of losing their job if they didn't show up. Um, here's a picture of the building before, so let me just do this quickly so I can get to the, the reactions. Uh, here's what it looked like after the collapse. Um, there's a famous uh, a photographer did a series called The Deadly Price of, of Clothing. Um, this is some of the victims. This is the last uh, woman to be found alive in the wreckage. Um, this is a, yeah, it's a, it's a mother whose uh, children were in, in the factory and knocked down. Now, this was a blow to the brand Bangladesh, and this is one artist's take as to what happened to, to the brand. Um, and converting retail buildings into factories is common practice in Bangladesh. And, and this might be an accident, but the policies of paying rock bottom wages and taking measures that, that are, are shortcuts that endanger workers and garment workers in Bangladesh are a policy that, that's widespread and, and is sort of the, the brand label of, of Bangladesh. In the United States, after it happened, the United States is the big single um, uh, destination of clothes made in Bangladesh. There was a strong reaction uh, in the business press, newspapers, urged U.S. retailers to sign on with an accord on, on fire and building safety that 151 um, European firms had signed up to. Um, it's a groundbreaking accord, and that's part of the reason I want to talk about uh, Bangladesh, in that this is an accord that made the brands, the retailers, jointly responsible for the conditions in the factories, along with the owners of the factory, that made their product. And it's also, le also legally binding, and I think it has some effect on this proposition about what you do for safety. Um, now, there was also a bunch of commentary um, in, in the business press, and one of the articles was this one uh, that Ben wrote. Um, and I think it's a basis for sort of laying out our differences and for me to at least say what I agree with it and what I don't. And I'll try to speak at his speed. Sweatshops in Bangladesh improved lives of the workers and boost growth. That's what he basically told you. Um, now, here's what's right. Um, I think, let me emphasize two things. The garment industry is really key to Bangladesh. It's the leading sector of the economy. It's responsible for 80% of the exports. Um, it's grown fantastically, tripling. The exports tripled uh, just in the years 2005 to 2010. And Bangladesh is now the second larger expo largest exporter of garments in the world after China. Now, something I've always said and um, Ben is right about is that the relative pay in the garment industry compared to other I industries that hire women on a large scale is, is large. Um, it's 14% difference and even larger if you look at the other employments for women, um, most typically domestic service. They pay nothing at the same rate. That part is true. Now, what I would argue, that doesn't convince me to support sweatshops. I think what Bangladesh needs is jobs. They need jobs with decent working conditions, and they need jobs that, that um, um, pay uh, a wage that, on which people can survive. Um, now, look, despite economic growth on that kind of scale, you can look at what happened to working conditions. They didn't improve over that period. Uh, Rana Plaza was just the last of several cases of, of real um, tragic uh, tragedies in the garment industry. The first mass fatality um, incident happened all the way back in 1990. Just a few months uh, earlier at Tanzarine uh, Fashion, uh, 117 workers um, died in a, in a fi factory fire. Um, 600 Bangladeshi garment workers have died in uh, factory fires since 2005. Um, the wages didn't improve either. And this is why I, I don't want to endorse what was said. Um, wages are rock bottom. They are, are indeed rock bottom. They were flat over the decade from 2000 to 2010. A seamstress in Bangladesh gets half of what a seamstress in Vietnam gets per month, one-fifth of what a seamstress in China 
Yes. And the other part of his argument that I at least want to get is that Ben calls the standard economics argument, and I think everybody calls it that, is, hey, look, these jobs pay better, and people choose them. Well, they might choose them, but I would submit they don't choose them voluntarily. And if I can borrow a phrase from Ben's book, which is it, the whip of necessity is what brought workers into the garment factory, and, and it's what brought them back to the garment factory even after Rana Plaza, as the Wall Street Journal article pointed out. Now, my take on sort of why Ben thinks we can't have minimum wages or, or safety conditions is that he thinks that we're at a point where, um, there, that we've reached a point where if you were to do that, you would lose jobs. Um, I once wrote that you'd have to be an economic illiterate not to think that demand curves for labor were negatively sloped. And I still think that's right. But I also think we can look at the responsiveness to the kinds of changes that are being advocated, the employment responsiveness to the kinds of changes that would both increase, and they're both costs, safety and wages. So let me move quickly. Improving safety wouldn't cost a lot in Bangladesh. Um, it costs about $3 billion, is that, that's the number, right? Um, yeah, about $3 billion, um, and if you spread it over five years, it's about 10 cents a garment, um, according to the Workers' Rights Consortium. Even Paul Krugman, who once wrote an article called In Praise of Cheap Labor, now sort of supports this kind of reform. Um, wages. Um, after uh, a, a, you know, demonstrations at 400 factories in late 2013, Bangladesh doubled its minimum wage. It's still lower than that of most other garment exporters in the developing world. Now, those wage increases are not a large portion. Well, what happened to my, to, well, it's the green bars. And what it is is 21 cents out of the $8.41 of factory costs to make uh, um, cotton jeans in Bangladesh. And what that means that if they don't cost a lot, there's not going to be a lot of increase in the price. And so you can actually increase wages, and you can probably do it without diminishing profits because you can pass on the, the cost to employers. Um, and you can pass on the cost to employers. Wow. Something happened here. Hold on. There are, there are the labor costs. There was three of those. And my friend Bob Poland, which is the last thing I'll say, did a study once in 2001 where he asked what would happen to the overall price of a $32 casual shirt if you doubled the wages uh, of, of, of the non-supervisory personnel in Mexico. He said, well, the price would increase by about 50 cents, 1.4%. And that's well below what any of the surveys suggest that people are willing to pay for garments that are made under good working conditions. So I don't believe it's, it's a victory for sweatshop workers that we have an increased minimum wage and that we haven't secured safe working conditions. I don't think they're going to lose jobs. And I actually think it's a human tragedy that those things haven't happened. We're going to take a seven-minute rebuttal. Let's begin. All right, thank you, and I appreciate this, and I think this is going to be a fruitful exchange back and forth. I'll start just very briefly on the, the tragedy in Bangladesh. Uh, I, of course, agree with John that it was a tragedy, and those are heartbreaking pictures that one can show, but that doesn't necessarily get us from here to there in terms of improving their conditions, nor does it condemn the industry as it exists in Bangladesh. I'm sure we, our hearts would all go out if we saw pictures of a child who died in a house fire in the United States and a weeping mother, but we wouldn't conclude from that, therefore houses are inherently dangerous in the United States and we shouldn't live them, we should go back to dwelling in caves. We recognize that, that there's risks associated with being in houses and benefits, and in some cases the ex post, the afterwards, for an individual ends up being tragic. But for the four million other Bangladesh garment workers, as John points out, it's a step up in their lives. And I certainly wouldn't want to do something to avoid a few tragedies that would impoverish the millions who are there. I 
I think I should end with the last point, because this is actually the fundamental one between us, and maybe we can spend more of our time on it. So I'm glad that John agrees with me that demand curves slope down. The empirical question is, how steeply do they slope down? So as you raise the cost, because you can talk about the safety cost and how much per garment, but it's still a raising of a cost that employers aren't going to passively accept. If they could simply increase the price for their products right now, the extra 10 cents, 50 cents, whatever you said for a shirt, a profit maximizing firm would already be trying to do this. Now there is a way you could shift out the demand for labor that wouldn't necessarily unemploy workers. If the firms are advertising our workers work with good working conditions and consumers value that more in the head, that can shift the demand curve out and implicitly increases their productivity. But this has to be a business decision. It has to be a marketing strategy by a firm because not for all products is that going to be true and certainly not in the same ratios, which means if you mandate it as a part of law, you're necessarily throwing workers out where this situation does not apply. Firms where it does apply have every incentive to do it. However, big caveat on this. We gotta be real careful about how you do it because it's very easy for a firm to certify and say, we're paying a living wage, have the right to unionize, have good working conditions, buy our product. And you feel good about yourself buying that, but you realize that they stopped subcontracting in Bangladesh and instead subcontract to somebody in the United States now where those good conditions are there and easy to advertise or even just shift out of Bangladesh to places like Vietnam and China that are a little bit better that you showed, or all the way to Latin America, then we're not helping the poorest of the poor. We're throwing it. We feel good about ourselves. And there's a fact, the group that does this shop with a conscience guide, if I had my slides back up there, there's one I have later that maps their source factories around the globe. The majority are in the United States and Canada, but they sell this as if you're helping sweatshop workers. When it comes to the legal mandate, we do actually have a recent good study on this of what the empirical magnitude is. In Indonesia, so this was published in the American Economic Review uh, by Harrison and Scorsi, and it was an article that was bending over backwards trying to be favorable to the anti-sweatshop movement. If you just read their abstract and their intro, they say things like, we can't find any additional unemployment effect of anti-sweatshop activism after controlling for the minimum wage. That makes it sound like anti-sweatshop activism has been harmless there. But what they actually empirically estimate is from 1989 through the mid-1990s, Indonesia raised its minimum wage a number of times, essentially doubling it in real terms. And what did they find? They found that 12 to 36% layoffs in the apparel industry as a result of it. So as much as more than a third of your workers get laid off while you're increasing the minimum wage for the others. That's the trade-off we're talking about. Economics is about trade-offs. Those, some of those workers who remain in their jobs feel better off because of this, but as many as a third of them going into these much worse alternatives. I don't think that's something that's uh, on net improving lives there and certainly not contributing to the overall process of growth that leads to the higher wages. Um, this isn't like a ideological, this is AER, this is top economics journal that's doing this. Uh, the other study that you mentioned, the pollen, uh, was uh, published I think in 2001 and it's an atrocious empirical study. So he, does, he looks at wage growth um, and apparel employment, just two things that's like horrible statistical work and says, look, as uh, wage growth has happened, there's not a negative correlation that's statistically significant with um, uh, growth of employment in the apparel industry. Therefore, we can impose minimum wages. Well, that's not actually what he's looking at. So to try to make this intuitive, if you took Hong Kong from 1960 to 1970, over that time, the workers were becoming more productive through exactly the process of development I talked about. Well, as they became more productive, that increases their pay, and also more companies were going there. Employment increased. From that, you can't extrapolate that you stick that data point in pollen's regressions, and it appears to be saying, I can legislate higher wages, but it's not doing that at all. He's mistaking what's going on entirely. The pro he's actually documenting the process of development that I talk about, and incorrectly assuming, therefore, there's no relationship between these things, and I can just price labor out of the market. Nowhere does he articulate a method. Now, what I've tried to do in this moment here is articulate one mechanism through ethical branding, how John might be able to better increase workers' wages. But this is what we have to do for each one of these things that anti-sweatshop activists want to agitate for, is articulate what is the causal mechanism that would allow it to increase their productivity or increase their alternatives so that they don't get unemployed. And I don't think any of the ones that any of the scholars who have worked on this are at all robust, and none of them justify imposing laws. What they do justify is scholars such as John and other business ethicists I know going to companies and showing them their results and saying, hey, you guys might be able to do this profitably. And if companies adopt it, I say, good for the world, good for John, good for that company, it's a win-win-win. But the fact that companies aren't doing it, or aren't doing it more widespread, tells me that it's not universalizable. 
Uh, and in fact, we see this trade up. In fact, the, I'll end with the kind of darling of the anti-sweatshop movement right now, uh, the Ultra Garcia factory in the Dominican Republic. It's being held up as, look, we can do this factory and we can treat our workers ethically there. It sells to lots of colleges and universities doing apparel. Uh, and they say it's all ethically produced. They have the right to organize. They have a living wage. All of this is true. I don't think the company's actually been profitable yet, which there's nothing in my argument that says you can't do charity that requires people to stitch for you while you're giving them charity. But we shouldn't confuse that with a profitable business strategy. But beyond that, it's actually an illustration of the trade-offs that I've been describing. And this is what they hold up as their shining light right now, because that was the location of the, BB, uh, the BJ and B factory, which employed 2,000 workers in 2001. It was targeted for anti-sweatshop activism for not having exactly the type of conditions that they have in the Alta Garcia factory. They got them to sign an agreement in 2003. The factory started violating it in 2004. The agitators went back and got them to sign it again. While they were complying with this, they were decreasing their employment. By the time the company actually closed, uh, in 2007, I believe it was, they were down to 234 employees. They used to employ 2,000. Now this new ethical factory that's taken that same building, that's being held up as a success, employs about 120 workers. There's nothing that I've said that doesn't say that you can't impoverish the majority of 2,000 for the benefit of 120, but that's the trade-off that they're making. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. A seven-minute rebuttal by John Miller. Um, so it's hard to know where to start because now I've got 10 minutes and 7 minutes. Um, but on, on the rebuttal on the Poland piece, I, I think my assessment of the econometric work is quite different. And I'd be glad to talk at length about the econometric work at some point. Um, the Alta Grecia case was uh, a case where they had actually made an arrangement where they were going to be the exclusive providers to uh, an array of universities, and then that was um, uh, ruled a, res uh, a violation of uh, a restraint of trade, and, and the deal fell through after that. But I wanted to go back and sort of say a, a couple of other things. Um, first, um, productivity is important in the determination of wages. Um, what the evidence says is that wages globally are determined by productivity 70 to 80 percent. And I think that's actually the study that, that you quote. Um, there are alternative studies that have been done. Danny Roderick, the international, the globalization expert and international economist, um, he found that with that amount determined that wages can vary up to 40 percent either way depending upon um, the political arrangements in a, an economy. It can depend upon the bargaining power of workers, whether or not they're, they're unionized. So there's plenty of difference. And I'm not convinced that the upper bound and the lower bound, which you talk about, really come together. The other thing that I find problematic about that argument is that it's an argument made with micro -econ with economic theory. Um, if that's the case, I'd like, to, if it's empirically true, I'd like to see some evidence that that's the case. I mean, this is an argument from authority. It's not an argument from, from um, looking at an empirical description of the upper bound and the lower bound and seeing some kind of compression or whether or not that's the case. And I think it's really problematic for somebody who goes out of their way to talk about the next alternative is that lower bound is really considerably lower than working in a garment factory. That suggests whether, whether this, uh, this, they get squeezed together or not, the distance between them truly has to start out as being very far. And then, I, you know, I know the work on, 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 on labor law and stuff like that, um, but what you're getting sold is the proposition that, look, what's got rid of sweatshops is productivity increases. Sweatshops are good starter jobs. They bring in manufacturing. Um, when manufacturing increases, that, that leads to better working conditions with higher productivity. Now, I don't think that's consistent with what's happened empirically. It's not consistent with what's happening um, in, in Bangladesh. And I don't think it's consistent with what happened in the United States. 
Um, in the United States, when we saw gains in producti productivity, gains in productivity were part of the story, but it wasn't sufficient. Um, after the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in New York, we already saw a factory law put in place. In 1938, when Francis Perkins, who was an eyewitness to the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, was the Secretary of Labor, those laws got shepherded through Congress to be the basis of, of the minimum wage, the Fair Labor and Standards Act, limiting hours, and stuff like that. Now, if this was only the realization of gains already made through increased productivity, why was there so much resistance to that kind of legislation? Second question, if it's productivity that, that's gotten rid of sweatshops, why have sweatshops returned to the United States? Well, productivity might not be growing as quickly as it did before in the United States, but it continues to grow at about twice the pace now since 1948 that compensation for employees has grown. It's a why, it, I got a slide of it, but it basically shows this widening difference. Well, productivity has not gone down in the United States, but sweatshops are back. If it's productivity alone, how is it that sweatshops come back? This is a stage. It lifts you up. You've increased productivity. Not decent working conditions, violations in, 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 in working conditions that, 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 that violate law of wages and hours in the United States. If you look at garment factories, it's back to about more than half of them that, 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 that have those kinds of violations. And why? I think the story is pretty clear. We're not enforcing labor law in the United States. The number of inspectors we have per establishment has dropped precipitously in the last 30 years. Two, two minutes and a second point. Um, and the other thing that's happened is that union coverage in the garment industry has dropped precipitously. Workers have less bargaining power than they did before, and what we have for labor law goes unenforced. And that's not only my position, that's the advocate of market-led globalization theorists also. But Jagdish Bhagwati, um, who wrote a book in defense of globalization, makes exactly the, the same point. So I think the history of the countries that were mentioned here is it's a combination of things. And it's actually the kind of argument that Simon Kuznets, the Nobel Prize winning economist, made about when does inequality go away. It goes away when people move from the rural areas to the urban areas and get more political bargaining power. Um, and I've got one minute now. All right. I've, I've got to look at my list to see what else I, I don't agree with. And the, the other thing that I hope to convince you of, then is to become a supporter of the accord uh, on, on fire and worker safety in Bangladesh. It's an agreement made with retailers that initiated it. It's an agreement that says that the retailers are going to have put up over the next five years $2.5 million to guarantee that the working conditions in their factories are safe. Um, it's an agreement that is legally binding. It's been bargained with two leading international unions and with the large retailers overseen by the ILO. It's a tremendous step forward. And that kind of joint liability agree, uh, agreement is also part of what nearly eliminated sweatshops in the 19, in, by the 1950s, 1960s in the United States. And, who did that? It was the International Ladies' Garment Union. So if anybody hasn't heard of unions, that's the, they, everybody's heard of the International Ladies' Garment Union, the ones that sing, right? They got those kind of jobber agreements or agreements where they made the brands jointly responsible for safety, paying decent wages, and what the brands got out of it was a steady flow of, of product and a lot of reputational value. And then the NBR, latest study you should look at for the survey stuff. Oh. Ben wants to come up here. And uh, we have a microphone here in the front for, for questions. Let me, let me start off with a question here. This is a good economic question on this graph that you have. Yeah. You notice in Bangladesh and Vietnam have a higher duty cost than yeah. uh, the others. So let me propose, if, if other countries lowered those taxes, would that provide the room for better working conditions and better wages? Let's start off with Ben. And would that happen if it did? 
Yeah, on their margins, right? So one of the things that determines a worker's revenue productivity is how much the product sells for in the United States. When you put a tariff on that, that drives down the value that that worker creates for the firm. So on the margin, it, would, it wouldn't like cure poverty or anything, but it would make them slightly more productive than increased pay a little bit. Yeah, he's right. That, I, I agree with that. Um, one of the reasons the duties are, are higher in Bangladesh has been with the uh, violation of labor law, the standards that the U.S. has imposed on Bangladesh before the, the, the most favored nation status is, is put in place again. And I think that's a very good move. It's created a fund for the victims of, of, of the Rana Plaza uh, disaster. It's actually started to get um, Bangladesh to have policies that have uh, that no longer um, go after trade union activists. Um, you know that, that beat them up, actually kill them. Um, that those kinds of policies have been why George Miller, who was probably the most active member on the Labor Committee in the House in the conference that I was at Harvard talking about this, just said, "Look, we're not lifting." Uh, going back to first phase, uh, most favored nation status until those kinds of improvements could take place. But in general, I agree exactly with what you said. Well, I invite you to come up to the microphone and ask a couple questions. I know you have them. So first one is always the most difficult, so come up and do that. Uh, ben, I'll ask, on John's behalf, he brought forward a, uh, uh, a coalition and a proposal for a voluntary um, agreement among manufacturers that they put up money and guarantee certain conditions. Yeah, is, that, I, is that acceptable to you? I think if, factory, if, if factories want to voluntarily do things like this, they can, but we should not kid ourselves about what any of this is going to accomplish. So in part, it's going to be, if that becomes the barrier, if we have to belong to this in order to be able to export from Bangladesh without being shunned in the uh, first world, it's going to result in fewer people going to Bangladesh to invest in the first place, and that's on net bad. Um, secondly, with this, um, I can't imagine that uh, you put up the cost of this earlier. I think it was roughly three billion dollars over five years or something like that. That if the companies just wanted to spend this much, that this is the best way to help the workers. That translates with four million uh, Bangladeshi garment workers to about seven hundred and fifty dollars per worker. I bet you every one of them would take a check for seven hundred and fifty dollars rather than this safety accord. And that tells us what the mix of their preferences is relative to our first world activist feelings here. And we should be more concerned about what they want than what makes us feel good. Let me ask John to respond. Um, first, I don't think we know what their preferences are. Your study said that what if, you know, if you took the money out of your wages to include safety conditions, would you be for that? And your answer and, and the survey I think is convincing was no, right? But this is not coming out of their wages. But what, um, what I'm saying is, implicitly is, though, if the well, firms no, are going to no, do no, something no, no, to help no, 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 them, no, no, no. they no, could no, cut them a check no, instead. Let, let, let Jonathan get this out. You no, know, that, that's fine. Yeah. He's an excitable guy. You have to go with that. Um, look, the reason this is happening because there is an anti-sweatshop movement, that these large retailers are concerned about their reputation. The fallout from Rana Plaza was devastating. You know, the largest retailer doing business in, in uh, garment retailer doing business in Bangladesh initiated this program. This was a way to restore their image. This is a way that the Bangladeshi government hopes to restore the image of their brand so it doesn't look like the slides that, that uh, I showed. So I, I think, you know, I don't think the money's there to just give them cash. If I, I, you know, where is the political support for we give them cash? Now I understand, and I, you know, I know enough Milton Friedman to know poor people know what's best for poor people. But this is a process of, of a, an important step forward, and I think it's an important step forward that is only a beginning. And I think it's only a beginning because it's about safety. I think we need, and it's only in Bangladesh. So to answer your other question, and one of the ways that Krugman talked about this, these kinds of movements ought to be throughout the developing world and exporters. And he's convinced, and I think the evidence is pretty clear, this is not going to bring up uh, costs in the developing world that uh, countries that export garments to a point where they're going to be outcompeted by the developed world. Well, it, it's going to have to change the ratio. So if you put any sort of uniform standards around the country, around the world, those places that are relatively more product, uh, have higher productivity are going to benefit from it. The least productive places are going to be hurt by it. It's not an all or not. I think they're going to benefit in the end. Why don't we go to some questions? Sir. Uh, thank you. 
Is it on? It's off. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I guess my question is a lot of the uh, debate today is centered around the garment industry in particular, but uh, looking at it more broadly, do you think that sweatshops might artificially drive down the prices, which artificially increases demand and perhaps puts an undue strain on natural resources? Why don't we start with you, John? I, I, I couldn't hear. Could you repeat that? Oh, no, no. Can you repeat it? Because what, there's what a real bad echo. What you want to know is, do sweat shops bring a uh, uh, stress on natural resources? Yeah, due to the artificial lowering of the prices and then the artificial, the subsequent artificial increase in demand. Um, again, in other words, overconsumption. Yeah. Is there overconsumption? Is there an environmental cost as well? well let's do the latter first. There is an environmental cost. I think people have looked at it and seen that. Um, the, I mean, e even people that are advocates of, of, of sweatshops are concerned about the environmental cost of the kind of manufacturing that we're seeing. Um, in 2000, it was uh, Christoph and his wife, uh, Cheryl McGunn, wrote an article called Two Cheers for Sweatshops. And it wasn't three cheers for sweatshops because he was very concerned about the environmental damage of the kind of manufacturing we've seen take off in China. Um, uh, you know, consumption, um, well, we don't exactly see incomes going up a lot in the United States lately, but I, I take the, the meaning of your argument. Um, I, 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 I do think that um, one of the things we've seen is that I once wrote and got in a lot of trouble for writing this, that, you know, that Henry Ford sort of tried to pay workers enough so they could buy a car, and Henry Ford is this anti-Semitic who beat up labor unions, which everybody wrote, and labor union activists wrote and told me that. And Walmart tries to pay workers so little that they can shop nowhere else other than Walmart. So uh, in a different era, a few decades ago, I might have been more worried about overconsumption. I can start with environmental. environmental and we'll transition into development because that's the fundamental thing that we need to, to get into here. So uh, I think in the short run it brings environmental problems, in the longer run it doesn't. So and this is part of the general process of development, it's called a Kuznets curve. And if you just think about it intuitively, prior to industrialization, you weren't creating very much waste because you weren't creating very much stuff. Start creating stuff, you do it dirty to start with because you're poor, as you start getting richer you start creating stuff cleaner. So generally what we find, and I think it, I'm going to, I'm going off the top of my head, but it's somewhere in the three to $5,000 per capita range where you get to your worst environmental quality and then things start improving as you keep growing after that. Um, the first part is definitely true. The whole, it's called a Kuznets curve, not a Kuznets line. Uh, but uh, more generally then, this process of development, I think this is the important one. Because if the other things that have been mentioned here, unionization or if the gap between next best alternative and this is bigger. Any of these things, even if any of them were true in the extreme, or if your Danny Roderick estimate of 40% is 100% accurate, it's still not transformative from the extreme poverty that these people are in. There's two things that do that. One is migration. You let them leave that country and move here. Take a Haitian out of Haiti, move him to the United States, his productivity goes up by a thousand, actually his income even, goes up by a thousand percent overnight, instantaneous. No one's proposing I might, maybe John would, to bring that many people here, uh, but it's certainly not politically realistic in the United States right now. Uh, that's an instantaneous development. The other one's the process of development, which means building their productivity there. It's not a magic bullet. It doesn't happen instantly. I'm not at all troubled when you point out growth in Bangladesh without growth in wages in a 10-year period there. This could be perfectly consistent as other people are coming out of agriculture and into manufacturing there. Uh, where we have seen the development, though, it's been magnificent. I mean, look at Hong Kong. They were pre-industrial, circa 1955. They were first world status by 1980. Guess what they never passed while they were growing? Not a single minimum wage law. Their wages went up because their productivity went up. This is also the process we saw in the United States when we see these different working conditions. Take child labor. Child labor in the United States, my home state, your home state now, Massachusetts passed the first, national, uh, uh, first child labor law, I think it was 1842. It said children under 12 can't work more than 10 hours a day in a factory. There was no restriction at all. That's the type of things that were being passed. They were non-binding. When you get up to the progressive era, you finally get national ch uh, child labor legislation, but not until 1938. Our income uh, in today's dollars is over $10,000 then. Look around the world. When countries have $10,000 per capita income, there is no child labor. 
These things came in after the process of development. The, the economist Claudia Golden and others who studied this error looked at mandatory school attendance laws, child labor rates. What they find is after you control for economic growth, that productivity growth stuff, these laws had no effect. This is the process that transforms people over time. So we get the environmental problem in the beginning. As they grow, that and these other problems start going away. Let me, let me uh, uh, oh, go ahead. Can, can I just respond yeah. briefly? Um, uh, before we got up here, I had said to Ben that you know that he, he's an advocate of reducing in, in barriers to immigration, um, probably in his heart of hearts, but nearly eliminating them. And I am too. And I, I actually said to him that I thought his argument, which is an argument of, of equals, or at least arguments of mutual beneficiaries in a wage exchange, would be much stronger if labor had as much mobility. Having mobility determines and, and sets the set of, of best alternatives much more widely, right? And then I could believe much of what Ben said. I don't disbelieve everything. I tried to point out that I didn't. But I think that argument would be much stronger, and the economic effect, as I think we both believe, would be tremendous. Um, with respect to um, um, the uh, child labor um, I, and, and what's happening to wages, I don't think we live in the economy that the United States came up in or Massachusetts came up in. Um, I think there are concerns about child labor. Um, regulating child labor is, is a, a thorny issue, and it can impose real costs. Um, one of the proposals you see both on the right and the left is to compensate parents who, who um, you know, whose children formerly work. Now, that just, as you would say, you've got to have resources to do that. But there's actually a political movement to do that, and we've seen examples of that happen. And I think that speaks to why these kinds of examples of, oh, well, if this is how they did it in the past, you can't do it today, it, it don't hold. It's a different political environment. Although I do think, look, even if you go back to 1911 and 1938, um, there were consumer movements. Um, um, when middle class women there were out on, on the picket line with ladies' garment workers, um, shirtwaist workers that were on strike. There was a kind of consumer, better to do, better, more well-to-do women that actually were part of the movement to better their working conditions. And I think that's what's happening in, in, in the global economy, too, and I would think it would be incumbent upon all of us to take advantage of it. And I still think if it's just productivity, I don't understand why it is what shops are back here in the United States. Point blank, real short on that. What we're calling, or what you're calling sweatshops in the United States don't look like sweatshops in Bangladesh for the most part. And the workers that you see in it aren't the workers who have had the increased productivity in the United States. It's usually stories of illegal immigrants who don't have access to other labor markets. So that doesn't do anything to undermine the argument that productivity growth for the United States people has them out of sweatshops. Let's take another question. For Dr. Miller, what do you think the limits of legislation is? In other words, can we just legislate people into prosperity and better working conditions? What are the limits of legislation? The question is, yeah, 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 yeah. Can, can you legislate pro prosperity? Well, my, my answer is you can't, you can't create prosperity that's widely shared without sets of, of labor laws and labor standards. Um, but if you ask me, can legislation alone produce prosperity? I think the answer is no. We need investment, we need productivity growth, but when the benefits of that productivity growth have been widely spread, it's happened when we put labor standards in place. Um, there's a book that um, by Freeman and Elliott where they talk about the effects of globalization and the inequality of, of the gains from globalization, and they said, can globalization work? And their answer is, yeah, when there are mechanisms that, that will ensure us that, that, the that the distribution of the gains from globalization are, are, are greater. And I, I don't even quite know what the problem is, um, other than the productivity argument. But you know, nobody's going to tell you that legislation alone is going to be the key to prosperity. But I would actually 
Well, it is true. Some people tell you that productivity alone is. I would submit it's the combination of two, and that's what the historical record is showing. I, I would say that it's the productivity, but I wouldn't call it alone. I would call it productivity with a competitive environment and good market forces. And it's no accident that the countries I listed of sweatshop countries circa 1960 who made the jump from pre-industrial to first world standard, Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea, uh, Singapore. These were some of the freest economies in the world. So the most capitalistic. Absolutely, look at the best measure we have of this is called the Economic Freedom of the World Index. It yeah. goes back to 1970. It's across, it's got five different measures, size of government, regulation, monetary unit. They, they were the top of the, the heap there. And they made this transition. You want to the trade and development policies of Taiwan. Yeah, I wrote a dissertation on it, actually. Yeah, and you don't believe they're a, an example of managed trade, and you don't believe that they're an example of, of government actively entering into, to, through infant industry arguments and, and actually developing industries like the chemical industry? Governments in Taiwan and Japan, with Midi, and in South Korea, did do interventions in the market trying to guide industrial policy. Nobody disputes that. What I dispute is it had anything to do with their process uh, uh, prosperity, their growth, what we find is more errors than successes. This is back to a knowledge problem that they fundamentally can't solve. This is what I worked on in a dissertation showing why Amsden and others are wrong. But simultaneously, you can have a little bit of statism in your economy while the majority of it's free market, and that little bit of statism doesn't kill your growth. But the message of let me, the East Asian miracle question. study was exactly the opposite. John showed us some, Hong Kong. Some, We're John showed us some pretty interesting and, and sad photographs. My immediate thought was, if there was a government there that enforced sure. regulatory things such as building codes, so is part of this answer that these governments, knowing that if their reputation is hurt, that they have to put in regulations to make sure that there are certain building standards and safety regulations, otherwise uh, the marketplace by, uh, uh, by the media will drive business to someplace more favorable. Uh, I'm not sure where your second... Well, the idea that if Americans know if the that, that, selling. That, that this brand is coming out of Bangladesh, the Bangladeshi government says, we can't have that, we need to improve our image, oh. we'll take on the regulatory challenge of building codes. Is that a better answer, or is that an answer at all? Uh, this is, in fact, something that happens, uh, but I think it's bad because it deters employment growth in Bangladesh, where they desperately need it. There's a question on the floor. No, no, could I? No, I, I, let's have John finish up. Go ahead. Uh, I'd like to know your opinion about the risks in the U.S. So let's say um, if we increase the wages and if we increase um, the total um, wealth in Asia, what are the risks in the U.S.? Because um, Asia is a market of supply and um, U.S. is a market of demand. So if we increase everything, uh, will it trigger the the increase of wages here in the U.S. Seeing if I can try to follow the question. So in Asia, they create, and here we buy, and if we increase wages in the United States, what is the impact? No, if they increase wages in Asia, it will, the cost of it will pass down to consumers and businesses here in the U.S. Oh. What are the risks affiliated with that? Oh, well, I think if, if we have a process of economic development that's going on and wages are rising as they are in some of the provinces of, of China and yeah. other places, that this is good for them and it's not at all harmful to us. It's because they're becoming more productive and they've got more stuff to trade with us and that's wonderful for both of us. Uh, I wouldn't characterize us, though, as a nation of demand and not supply. Unfortunately, we actually have to give foreigners things in order for them to send us stuff. Um, so when you hear about a trade deficit, it's because you're narrowing their account to a particular type of... Uh, category of goods and services and not counting other stuff that we trade. So, um. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I, I couldn't hear part of the last. And also, I'm sorry, but um, in the eight and a half feet in Boston, the uh, snow, it seems to have damaged my hearing aids, which no longer work, and I didn't even bring them with me. They're somewhere in the snow. Um, I, I thought the first part of Ben's answer was right. Um, that what you actually do see in China and what you've seen is an increase in, in wages. Um, it's been productivity growth, it's also been a lot of trade union activity and just sort of the beginnings of trying to build an independent trade union uh, movement in China. And wages have gone up, but I think it's highly beneficial to uh, the Chinese economy. Um, uh, retained earnings in these 
export firms are extremely high, at least in these very high savings rates, and it's money that funnels over here. And and you know, and, and I think this is this will break will will help create a more balanced Chinese economy. Um, I we also have already seen as that's happened that things like garment production and stuff like that is has, has left China and gone elsewhere. Um, so I, I think this is all a good thing. And what did you, I couldn't hear what you said about demand. Oh, just to, to say that we have a trade deficit does not equate to us being a nation of demand and not of supply. Um, Which she I, didn't I say, I wasn't trying to stick What we are around. is a nation of spenders. Um, and we're surely not a nation of savers. Uh, but I would sort of, um, I'm not gonna turn my nose up at this trade imbalance because I do think the argument is that, you know, as consumers, we get something out of that, and what we're interested in is the, the terms of trade. Although what that meet has meant for less educated workers, um, they, they don't get enough imports at cheaper costs to make up for, for the kinds of jobs and opportunities that are losing. My question is, can I just yes, go ahead, follow up. Hand over. My question is rather about not benefits for China and Asia, because there are benefits in there, but what are the benefits for U.S.? Assuming that all continue to rise as yes. living conditions and wages go up in, in China, what is, what is the effect on the United States? We get, uh, well, it's a question of why their wages are going up. If their wages are going up because they're producing more stuff, becoming more productive, that's great for us. We've got more stuff going there. If, now this is where we probably differ, I'd say, if you just passed a high minimum wage for China, that's going to end up making China produce less and give us less stuff and would make us worse off. They, uh, they have higher costs and make less stuff there. If their higher cost, though, comes from becoming more productive, that's win for us. Now, the factories might leave like they left Hong Kong, right? Some people will call us, and I haven't ever heard John say this, uh, but some people will call it it's a, you know, a race to the bottom. The factories work one place, and they leave, and they go cheaper, and it makes it sound like it's scorched earth. It's like they left Hong Kong because Hong Kong got too expensive for them. That's a good thing. The Hong Kongese grew, and they go somewhere else, and we just see this shift coming. I mean, the problem for Africa is they don't have enough of these factories. Uh, but when, eventually, when you run out of cheaper places in the world to go, it's just going to change how those garments are going to be produced, and it's going to look more like when we make them in North Carolina than when you make them in Bangladesh, and that's a good thing. The relative price of, price of clothing will be higher compared to other goods, but we'll have more total stuff, and it's a better world for everyone. How does it affect us? Uh, well, I, I think it's one of the things that I think is good is that it's going to change our macroeconomic, our trade relationship with China. Um, I, I, I think that I, you know, productivity is increasing in China. Minimum wages are increasing in China along with it. Um, workers are getting more bargaining power. It's not just legislation, it's productivity growth. I think it's, it's good for China. Um, I think it's, you know, it's not a problem for us, but it does make me go back and think about you know, what Krugman has said about these kinds of movements for safer conditions across the developing world that exports garments and maybe in other industries. And what he says is, as long as the increases are such that the, that the, what's, what the money being spent here is such that these um, co uh, countries remain competitive, he sees this as a good thing. Or even if you go back to Jeffrey Sachs, who you quote in your book, right? Jeffrey Sachs said, who was, who was part of the, these economists who said, Oh, what we need now is more sweatshops because that's a step in, 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 along the development path. But he said, all the ice with safer conditions. And I also think the safety issue is really important because when you ask people sort of what labor standards should be there, what kind of legislation should be there, I, at least when I've ever taught about this, and, and, and I think the evidence is pretty clear, people are really concerned about safety conditions. Ben, just on one fine point here. Competitiveness is not a yes-no question, though. You'd agree, of course. It's competitiveness on the margin. If Krugman's being disingenuous when he's being a pop writer and just saying, oh, they could still be competitive as long as we don't get rid of that. Competitiveness is always on the margin. So if you do anything that distorts the relative prices of labor across countries right now, it's going to bias against them on the margin. Then it's an empirical question of how big that effect is. We're going to run out of time. Right, Before we know it, let's get, to, let's get to one more question. Uh, I do have a question on of how big. Let's take this question. On the earlier point when you made of when do local governments intervene on higher building codes and safety standards. So my question is when does it take for 
the people, the local people and the local government to step in to raise those conditions? Why does it have to fall upon the companies or the other nations? Why should it fall on companies or an accord? Why don't the local governments in these areas take on these issues through regulation? Why, why is it, why is it uh, left to these companies to make that change? Well, it's left to these companies to make that change because local government hasn't done it. Um, one of the reasons local government hasn't done it is like in Bangladesh, uh, the Bangladeshi parliament is is dominated by representatives who have a stake in, in the garment industry. Um, and, and factory owners are, are adamantly opposed to unionization. I mean, this was a clear example of a violation of building codes. The, the extension at Rana Plaza from eight, five to eight floors was a clear example of that kind of violation. But on the other hand, converting retail um, buildings into factories wasn't a clear, into, into garment factories wasn't a clear violation, and it's a quite common practice. Um, you know, increasing the minimum wage, creating a, a fund for workers that, um, uh, that were victims of Rana Plaza, there are all kinds of initiatives that are happening with the retailers and with the government, and it's the retailers it's in some, you know, I think it's the kind of pressure of consumers that have got the, the brands to, to do something about it and has also put a pressure on the Bangladeshi over, government to try and do something. Uh, just very briefly, uh, and I'm not going to speak to local governments, but I'll just say home country governments. It's no accident that in every round of the World Trade, World Trade Organization negotiations, it's the developed countries that want to put international labor standards into the agreements, and it's the poorer countries who oppose it. The poorer countries understand if you adopt these things, it's going to hurt their competitive advantage and hurt their growth and prosperity in their own countries. That's why they don't do it. So why does it end up going to companies then? Because I think of a lot of sloppy thinking by people in the first world thinking that they're doing good with uh, their particular ethical desires on this stuff that actually end undermines the process of development. We're going to take one more question. Uh, we'll this question is directed towards Benjamin Powell. I was just wondering how you want to increase productivity, whether it's through technology, capital, labor. It seems to me like it has to be through technology, and if it is, then who's going to pay for that technology? Then there's no what? Who's going to pay for that technology? Oh, okay. Um, I don't have a position on the relative mix of technology, human capital, physical capital. In fact, it's something that's unknowable to anybody outside the process. What we need is the process of development, encouraging people to form capital, to improve human skills, and to create new technologies. And it's the profit motive that largely drives that. But how it manifests itself as a ratio between the three, there's no a priori either advocacy for or knowledge of. Does that make sense? favor direct foreign investment as opposed to financial investment is because it's supposed to have these technology spillovers. And the evidence on exactly how extensive those are is really quite mixed. If you look at 13 leading studies, I think six of them say, you know, there's a benefit that, that's, that's quite great. About six of them said there's hardly any benefit. Um, so we're wrapping this up, so let me ask one last question, yes, sir. and this will be very difficult being both professors and economists. You only have one minute, and I will cut you off directly at one minute to wrap up your argument. We'll start with you. I think we're at a moment in the global economy where there are reforms taking place, and I think there are reforms that really speak to the disadvantaged position that many workers find themselves in these sweatshops and the dangerous conditions. And I think it's in part uh, anti-sweatshop movement has gotten the retailers to take the lead in this. And this is a moment where we could really make a difference. The accord on, on, on fire and building safety is a tremendous step forward. It needs to be beyond Bangladesh. It needs to be beyond garment workers. Um, and, and it needs to be beyond just safety. But this is a, exactly the process that nearly eliminated sweatshops in the United States. I think this is an example where concerned global citizens have made a difference. Um, and, and I think it's something everybody should look at closely and should support. And it doesn't, well, anyway, I, I, I was. Thank you. Ben, one minute. We live in a world of trade-offs. 
And unfortunately, many of the things we desire that would make these workers' lives better come with a trade-off, and that unintended consequence is often worse than what the direct benefit of what you get. Uh, I've enjoyed this dialogue with John immensely today. It's actually been one of my favorites that I've done. Uh, but nowhere in it did I hear him articulate a mechanism for how to legislate a minimum wage that wouldn't have a trade-off effect of unemploying workers. At best, I've heard a, a general push towards safety instead, but with that, the only mechanism I've heard identified is maybe consumers will be willing to pay for it in the price of clothes. I say maybe, and this is something that companies need to explore and do as a marketing strategy of their own, because if you legislate it, you're necessarily going to impose it in industries and in particular firms that don't have that type of demand for their product, and you're going to throw workers into worse alternatives. That the real cure for this stuff is the process of economic development, unless someone's w willing to issue a few billion permanent residency visas to move to the United States right now. Let's thank both of our debaters for this incredible discussion. And thank you for being part of it, and that concludes this.